thank you thank you shikhar for organizing this and i will let uh, dr sujit kar who is the co faculty in charge of the central library to introduce the speaker we have today good afternoon everybody thank you so much sir uh, today we have uh, the workshop on fundamentals of health research a road map to scientific publications and we have representatives from elsevier publishing house uh, we have natasha glatimam and sikhar srivastava uh we are involved with uh, elsevier uh, to introduce the speaker natasha glatim uh, she is an engineering degree holder in biotechnology and uh, she is having more than 10 years of uh, experience in business research and uh, management consulting experience she is originally from india and she is now based in malaysia and uh, she has established herself as a healthcare thought leader and uh, she is the customer success team manager for south and southeast asia for elsevier and uh, without much telling about the details uh, i request ma'am to carry out the session thank you over to you dr tindakar sir glati thank you so much sir i'd like to first begin by saying thank you so much for inviting us here today uh, coming from elsevier it is our pleasure and honor to be here at this prestigious institution in this beautiful auditorium so thank you so much for having us here today my name is natasha i'm the customer success team manager <clears throat> and the main reason that we are here today is because um, elsevier is heavily invested in helping researchers research more and publish more as you can imagine it's a mutually beneficial ecosystem where if you are able to publish it benefits us as well and it benefits your career your growth as well uh, and then within the research community at elsevier our goal this year is to support the global south even more so we are very much interested in supporting institutions in india to be able to publish more not just with elsevier but across high value journals we would like to support your researchers as much as we can so today we're here to introduce the health research development program a dedicated program that works towards supporting large medical institutions like yourself to improve the quality and efficiency of research and increase the chances of getting published so today's presentation is like an opening it's like a trailer so if you're going for a movie before you go for the movie this is the trailer If you like today's presentation and if you think this is useful at the end of today's session there will be a QR code with a long list of topics and support that we can provide as part of this program so we would like to conduct this as a 12 month or a 6 month program where we interact with you on a regular basis so if you are finding this interesting give us feedback on that QR code and we'll come back to the team with more the library team with more Uh, customized services that we can provide as part of this program today's topic is fundamentals of health research uh, today we will try to cover what is the most important thing a researcher needs to know before they embark upon the research journey this is not to say that you are embarking upon a career so you are not an early researcher but you may be an experienced researcher but every time before you start a new research project when you are writing your research proposal these are the things that you need to bear in mind before you start your new research work so in today's session these are some of the things that we'll cover we'd like to first establish why is it important to conduct research in healthcare and why is it important to publish then when we're thinking of publishing what are some of the key criteria for editorial review what are some of the most common reasons for rejection and to avoid these reasons how can you create a publication strategy and then beyond publication how can you further promote your work so that you get the right outcomes that you need in terms of the citations in terms of research impact all those things uh we'll have a q and a at the end so these slides will be shared with kgmu so you'll have access to these slides as well um there are a lot of free resources tips and tricks included in the slides so we'd encourage you to whenever you have time go back to the free resources and try them for yourself uh the session i think is also being recorded and you'll have access to the recording as well so let's start by first establishing the importance of research in healthcare 
we do understand that research helps us to bring new products and services into the healthcare industry so whether it is a new drug a new medical device or even improvements in the hospital hand hygiene for example all of this needs to come on the basis of research because healthcare is a very evidence based industry we don't do anything until and unless there's proven evidence that the new practice will have positive impact on patient outcomes as well as positive impact on cost but it's not just about introducing new products and services even to improve existing products and services we need to conduct research we are not working in the kitchen where we can test and try and taste and improve things we can't do that in healthcare in healthcare even if we want to make very small minute changes in a treatment paradigm adjust dosages all of that has to come on the basis of evidence so even to improve existing products and services it's very important that we publish and create the relevant evidence so that everybody can adopt but besides the healthcare industry we're also doing this for economic returns and the greater productivity of the nation there's actually published research from bmj published in the uk so this was actually done in the uk where the study from bmj proved that for every pound that the uk government spends on health research they get 25 cents back in terms of economic productivity because people tend to stay healthier they spend lesser time in sickness they more productive they more active so spending on health research is not only for the scientific community not only for hospitals and patients there's also economic benefit for governments to invest in research however conducting research is not the end of the game it's not enough it's also very very important to publish the good work that you do as researchers as and as an elsevier as a publisher our motto is that what is not published does not exist that's because whatever you research whatever you publish is then available to others all around the world to adopt it doesn't help that you conduct research and then it sits somewhere in a cabinet in a closet we were talking about this earlier my father did a lot of my father was an anesthesiologist he did a lot of tinkering and tweaking to have a very very robust anesthesia machine in our clinic but he never published so he had a great machine in our i had a great machine right there in my house but nobody knows about it that's of no use you want to conduct research with the goal of sharing it within your institution within your community in india and around the world so that others can benefit from your work or others can also improve on your work that's why it's very important to extend your research into publication this is very important for those who are writing the thesis just writing the thesis and leaving it for academic purposes is half the journey if you want to go full circle you must also then think about converting your thesis into a few manuscripts and then aiming to get them published now when you're embarking upon that publishing journey that itself is very arduous it doesn't happen overnight it requires a lot of effort and patience and that's where our team from elsevier comes in we will support you to some extent in the research part but our greater support will lie in the publishing domain like how can we support you in writing a manuscript which is ready for publication and then supporting you through the publication domain as well so when you embark upon this whole publication journey there are some basic fundamentals that you need to keep in mind the first fundamental is the research process itself and the reason why we're establishing this is because the integrity of the research process is very very important this basic fundamental research process should be ingrained in your minds it's very important that we don't miss these steps no matter how experienced we are and these steps are first of all define your topic to define your topic you need to do a lot of literature review and i'm going to emphasize this again and again literature review almost never stops it's not like today i've done my literature review i've i've created my research question and that's it no literature review goes on throughout the study for many reasons which we will cover in today's presentation but at the very first step you need to do a lot of literature review to understand that in your topic what is known what is not known 
and what can be found out there will be many many questions which we don't have answers to we cannot do research on all of them so we need to know what do we know what do we not know and what can we realistically find out once you've identified this point number 3 what can be realistically found out you have to frame that into a research question your research question may be broad or it may be in the form of a very crisp hypothesis and you have to prove or dis disprove your hypotheses once you've defined your research question then you create a methodology do not be in a rush to create a methodology first for example when we start looking at the literature when we start identifying our topic many students at that point itself start thinking oh my questionnaire will look like this my questionnaire needs to have these these questions my questionnaire needs to be at this target audience do not jump the gun go step by step so that you don't have to come back and correct what you've already done if you jump to methodology without having a clear research question chances are that there will be gaps in your methodology which you did not expect so come back to the methodology is it's time consuming and it's a waste of time right so first frame your question then create a protocol which aligns with that question addresses the question get your protocol approved getting all the internal approvals is very very important it is again something which editors check when they're reviewing your manuscript get your study approved conduct the study collect the results and then write the manuscript don't be in a rush to jump any of these steps learn these steps and go in this order now when you start writing your manuscript you have a few options by right we all want to write an original article in an original article you have actually done an experiment maybe you did an intervention maybe you did a clinical informant intervention or a process change or maybe you used the questionnaire a survey you've actually created some sort of change and that change has created some new data new information and now you're publishing that so that would be called an original article but if you've not done a new intervention a new change you also have the option of writing a review article in a review article we don't do a new experiment rather we look at what is already published we look at many many sources of literature and we see what is already published and then we try to come to our own analysis and conclusions based on what is already written so that is called secondary research and it is written in the form of either a systematic review a meta analysis or even a narrative review so these two original articles and review articles are generally the most common types of research outputs that we see in the academic community but uh something to introduce you don't have to limit yourself to only this as clinicians you also have the opportunity to write case reports and case reports are very very important in medical literature case reports are for those of you who are new to research in a case report you basically describe observations of something which is not already known so maybe you have a patient who has a certain clinical condition but the symptoms that the patient is showing are unique and not documented anywhere so the patient is coming with some new symptoms which have not been documented or the patient is having a reaction to a drug which is currently not documented anywhere so that can be written up as a case report and why this is important we've been through this this is how new knowledge gets created in medicine a lot of the information about covid for example our first published literature in covid was all case reports because nobody had seen that disease before we didn't know how to treat patients we didn't know what symptoms to look out for so all this early information about covid was nothing but case reports everything about hiv back in the 70s early 80s when hiv was still coming up all the information about hiv was in the form of case reports original articles came much later so case reports is also a valid form of published uh, research that you all can do and there are journals which are dedicated to publishing only case reports you don't always have to look at original articles you can identify journals that specifically publish case reports apart from case reports there's also the option to write a letter to the editor or the methodologies in the methodology section we basically describe a protocol 
so maybe you are not ready to publish the results or maybe you want you still need time to complete the study or you are not satisfied with the results and you need to expand your study but the protocol that you've created is unique and novel nobody has tried that protocol before in that scenario there are journals that allow you to publish the protocols as well so that is what we call methodologies or brief communiques and then lastly uh, the experienced authors in the room they can write a letter to the editor this is a type of output which is very very restricted to those who are kols in the industry they are invited to submit letters to the editor most high value journals will invite authors to give their opinion on something which is published or give their opinion on a major trend in the community you get invited to write these letters but all of these are considered valid publication outputs they will get indexed in citation databases they will be considered as publications that you can explore now when you uh, write an original article this is the typical structure of an original article abstract introduction literature review methodology findings results and references in the results we can have a single section or we can break down results into discussion implications conclusions so this is a very quick overview as part of this program we have a dedicated workshop called the research writing or the best practices in research writing workshop where we actually go through the key sections of this entire original article and share how you can improve the quality of your writing for each of these in that workshop we go through it in a lot of detail on how to write tables how to write discussion how to frame your results section how to frame methodologies so that's a detailed workshop where we cover each of these points with uh, with some tools and some tips and tricks in a lot of detail so if you are interested in writing the section uh, give us that feedback on the qr code select the best practices in writing workshop and we'd be happy to conduct that detailed session on writing each of these sections now once you've written each of these sections you would submit your manuscript so what happens when you submit your manuscript to a lot of people that remains a black box people think oh my manuscript is gone now i don't know who to talk to i don't know who to contact i'm just going to wait to hear from the journal so it's very important for you to know what happens to your manuscript because if you know what's happening to my manuscript you can intervene which you are allowed to do so let's talk about that a little bit when you submit your manuscript the first thing that happens to your manuscript is that it goes goes through a journal editor screening this is step 1 so when you submit your manuscript there is a team of journal editors who screen this manuscript so every journal has a dedicated team but that dedicated team is swamped with work every single journal editor reviews between 10 to 20 manuscripts per day that's the volume of manuscripts a typical journal receives so that's why sometimes when these journals are overburdened they offload some of that editorial review to our teams within elsevia so it is still the journal's decision to select or deselect but they at this stage they may move some of the basic uh, manuscript screening to our side and actually that is the point when majority of the manuscripts get rejected at the journal editor screening stage depending on the journal that you submit it to between 6 to 60% of manuscripts get rejected there's also research done from the indian scientific community to support this fact so this is the stage which is most critical in terms of acceptance or rejection of your manuscript if your manuscript does get accepted at this point then it will go into a peer review the peer review as you can uh, as you all might be knowing any high value high impact index journal in fact any index journal has to have minimum 3 peer reviews minimum most high impact journals do 10 peer reviews those peer reviews can be single blind or double blind in a single blind peer review the reviewer knows who the author and the submitting institution is but the author doesn't know who the reviewer is in a double blind uh, peer review neither the peer reviewer nor the author know each other's identity right and a lot of times the peer reviewers that your manuscripts go to may not even be from the same industry or the same subject area you might have submitted a an oncology manuscript 
that then goes to a peer reviewer who is a mathematician and the logic of doing that is we'll come to that the logic of doing that is that your manuscript should be legible to every single scientific person or even a non scientific person so it is not we no but the peer reviewers are not experts in methodology they're ex experts in reading data if by reading data your paper makes sense to them they will continue to work with you so at the peer review process stage you may receive feedback if your manuscript gets rejected a lot of times especially if the if the peer reviewer is in a good mood they may give you feedback on what you can do to improve your manuscript they may tell you to change something in your study a lot of times they will tell you to read certain articles and think how they impact your discussion so you will get feedback if your paper gets rejected and you don't get feedback on why it was rejected at this stage you should go back to the journal or the publisher to question and you have the right to do that if it's an elsevier journal there will be a contact person or you can contact shikhar or me and we'll connect you we'll in, we'll try to understand internally on why the paper was rejected but especially at the peer review stage try to get feedback if you do get feedback try to incorporate and resubmit your manuscript so once it's accepted at peer review then the manuscript goes to an editorial board so there's journal editor screening peer review screening and then finally the accepted manuscript goes to the editorial board in very rare circumstances the editorial board may reject your manuscript not because your research is not strong and coherent but due to other reasons So, for example, when the Ukraine war broke out, many journals took a collective decision to stop publishing research from Russia. It was their way of penalizing Russian scientists. So, the research which was coming out of Russia might have been really, really good, but journals took a call to the editorial board of many journals took a call to reject manuscripts from Russia. that is not to say that the research was bad but that's a call that journal editorial board took so at that point the editorial boards can take a decision that we will not publish this manuscript for whatever reason and they will surely communicate the reason to you at that point if the editorial board accepts your paper you will receive the acceptance letter and the acceptance letter will mention the date and the volume in which your article will get published so that's the entire process of publication now when we receive most of our discussions will be centered around this part the journal editorial screening so when we receive the journal editorial screening there are some very basic things that we look for this is feedback coming from nature the first thing that a journal editor screening stage looks at is clarity of thought as you can see nature says clarity is the sole obligation of the scientific writer your manuscript has to use very few words to communicate what is the new information that you have discovered why is that new information important to the scientific community what is the impact of that information and how did you arrive at that information these three basic points need to be very clearly communicated in this order of importance the most important thing what is new why is it important and how did you find that out it your manuscript needs to very clearly mention this another actual feedback that nature once gave is this so this is actually feedback that the nature journal gave to an author you have not made it clear to me what the burning issue is so this is the why i may have done a very thorough piece of research the the methodology is correct the results are fine i've written it beautifully but why is this important why should the reader care about your topic that is the most important thing i have received manuscripts where the author was talking about a newly discovered very important mental health condition where a certain group of patients is scared of chickens is that important what is the percentage of patients in the world that are scared of chickens from the author's perspective this was a very new information it was very important to them they thought it's a new discovery 
but what is the relevance of the fear of chickens to the scientific community how many such people actually exist is there uh, do we do is there a treatment intervention that we need to be concerned about is there a habit behavior that we need to be concerned about none of that was addressed so if you are not able to communicate to the journal editor what that burning issue is why is your research important your paper will surely get rejected and people will generally not tell you this is a very good editor who gave this feedback to the author but many times you will not get this feedback uh why your paper was rejected because it did not clarify to me the importance of your findings a lot of times what happens is research gets rejected because it is not useful not useful not in the sense that it the topic is ir irrelevant but also because it is not new information this is again where literature search is very very important it's very important to make sure that everything that you are researching on is new a lot of times manuscripts get rejected because the literature review was not thorough enough to fully understand what is already known and i have seen this myself i have been in situations where i received a manuscript which was about a, a, a nursing survey survey done amongst nurses qualitative survey done amongst nurses in uh, in a certain hospital in india and they wanted to publish it but when i did a quick literature review on scopus myself i found that the same survey in a quantitative format had already been done in saudi arabia and this manuscript had not even referred to that survey anywhere in their study so they had not done a thorough literature review if you do a thorough literature review you will be able to understand whether your topic has been researched enough or not is it new enough or not a lot of research gets rejected because people don't do enough th literature review and they think that they have a research question but actually somebody has already answered that research question maybe even better than you so it's very very important to establish that the information that you are presenting is new it's important and you use a robust methodology to arrive at that information so this is that high level high level screening now when uh, as a journal editor we are given a few guidelines when we receive the manuscript the first thing we have to do is a dry read dry read means from the first word in the title to the last word before references we read the manuscript end to end no opinions no understanding just read end to end by reading the manuscript end to end if we feel that the topic is relevant and coherent which is it's new it's important and it's been presented correctly we go to step 2 in the first dry read if we arrive at the conclusion that the information is not new or not relevant we will not even go to step 2 in step 2 we start breaking things down so when we go into step 2 we start reading the manuscript in detail and the first thing that we look for is is the manuscript aligned with the journal aim and scope so the number one reason for rejection is actually a misalignment between manuscript and the journal aim and scope so every index journal has a dedicated aim and scope aim means what is the journal all about there could be journals who are very very focused on hiv research journals that are very very focused on oncology research or journals that only publish on transformative research journals that only publish on geriatrics journals that only publish on pediatrics that's the journal aim and then you have the journal scope which goes into the further details of the definition so there may be journals that are only publishing for indian authors or indian scientific community journals that are only publishing for a particular country journals that are only publishing for a certain group of doctors so that's your journal scope so a lot of times we receive manuscripts which are correct in every other aspect but the manuscript aim and scope doesn't align or the manuscripts objectives don't align with the journal aim and scope for example you may receive a manuscript uh, in which an adolescent study has been done on smoking and it has been submitted to a pediatric journal that will not be accepted because there's a difference between adolescent and pediatrics so that's a clear reason for rejection and actually a lot of studies show that the number one reason for rejection is a misalignment with the journal aim and scope 
If the journal aim and scope aligns, then we look at other aspects like clarity of research question, quality of methodology. Is the study valid? This is where my point about getting all the approvals comes in. Validity of the study is established by the approvals that you submit in your manuscript. Again, the editors or the peer reviewers are not experts sometimes. So we depend on the approval certificates. If it's a human study, there are certain approvals that you need to take and you need to make sure that you submit. Even if it's not a human study, there will still be some approvals that you need to get from your institution. Your institution research board or your research committee has to approve. These are some basic certificates that you have to submit with your manuscript. If those are missing, we will either give you that feedback that certain certificate is missing, please produce that, or we might reject. If it's a very grave error, then we might reject the study. And then obviously if the study is presented properly. So this is a very good summary. BMJ summarizes the top criteria in very crisp five points. All editors have similar criteria. So Wiley expands those five crisp points into nine. You can read it in your own time. Elsevier expands them into eight points, but they're basically the same. Sure. Ma'am, you'll have access to the slides, so don't worry. So like I was saying, Wiley puts it into nine points. Elsevier has very similar criteria, which are divided into eight points. And you will have access to the slides and the sources at the bottom, which are all free links. So you can have a look at the sources in your own time as well. So, uh, so yeah, so you can actually go through this in your own time. And like I said, uh, all of this will then be expanded in future sessions. So all the points that we have here, the research process, how to write certain sections, how to analyze data, we do have follow-up sessions in this entire program, which we can conduct if this is useful. So like I said, um, in the second stage, we look at the section by section analysis of the paper. In the section by section analysis, we start breaking it down into the quality of data, quality of uh, writing, and the impact of the writing. So in our writing workshop, we cover these three points. If you're presenting data, how do you present it in an effective manner? Effective also means how do you remove data which is not relevant to your study? How do you write in a manner which is concise and clean and yet presents your idea correctly? So not only do we do these workshops in terms of the writing and the quality, we also have manuscript review clinics. So that is done in small group sessions where if your team sends us a manuscript one month in advance, we will review the manuscript with our editors internally and then have a hands-on workshop to dissect the manuscript in front of you and see areas of improvement. So we can do this clinic section as well. So all of this is covered in the detailed workshops. Let's assume at this point that you've written your manuscript and now you're thinking about publication. That's where your need for a publication strategy comes in. And the first thing we share in the publication strategy workshop is that you need to create your publication strategy when you're submitting your research proposal. There are a lot of aspects and the most common, most important aspect of publication strategy, which is connected to the beginning of the research is your APC cost. <laughs> Chigar is laughing here. <laughs> So a lot of people ask us this question, can we build APC costs into the research project? Actually, yes. You just have to put it as a line item when you're publishing. And that's one of the major reasons why you need to start thinking about your publication strategy when you're writing your research proposal. Other reasons for this are how do you choose the journal? Because let's say you submit your research proposal to your institution review board. The institution review board wants you to publish in journals which have an impact factor above 10. But your topic is a very niche topic. It will probably not get published in, an, in a journal with an impact factor above 10 because it's a very niche area. That is a reason for rejection by the IRB. So your IRB's goals don't align with the research strategy, the research question that you have adopted. These things play come into play at the time of deciding your topic, at the time of writing your research proposal. That's why it's very important to start thinking about your publication strategy when you're writing your research proposal. 
So in the publication strategy, your most important components are what and when to publish. So your what is your content, it's your research. But the question is when. A lot depends on the timing of publication as well. Today, if you start submitting manuscripts related to COVID, it'll be very tough to get it published. If you would have submitted that manuscript two years ago, it would have been easier to get it published. So timing is very, very important. Similarly, some journals, they may have a certain aim and scope, but they have supplementary issues at certain times of the year. If your research aligns with a supplementary issue, then you need to plan your entire research according to that timing. If you want to publish in December and your project itself will take a year, you need to start working now. So all that timing is also very important. The second thing to think about is with whom to publish. Who will be your co-authors? Who will be your, uh, who will you acknowledge in your paper? Who will be your partner institutions? Are you going to do everything at and with KGMU or are you going to invite partners from outside? That not only depends on the resources and the ideas that they bring, it also brings credibility. If you uh, decide to publish in collaboration with a large medical institution or some or a medical institution outside India, that will automatically give your research global acceptance and the chance to publish in an international journal becomes higher. So these are again decisions which you need to take at the time of your research proposal because you need to submit who your partners will be in your research. And lastly, where to publish. The big question, selecting the right journal. So. These, this particular topic, selecting the right journal, is a full one and a half hour workshop. It's a hands-on workshop where we discuss various free and proprietary tools that you can use. But today I'll summarize that entire workshop into six points. So when you're selecting journals, we recommend you to look at these six aspects. The aspects in lighter colors are the qualitative aspects and the aspects in the darker color are the quantitative aspects. So on the qualitative side, first and most important, journal aim and scope. As I mentioned, misalignment with the journal aim and scope is the number one reason for rejection. You must make sure that you select a journal whose aim and scope aligns with your manuscript. The second one, journal audience. This is very, very important. Because you want your research to reach the right readers. I'll give you an example. In Singapore, everybody in Singapore wants to publish in Singapore Medical Journal. The impact factor of Singapore Medical Journal is less than five. But still people want to publish in Singapore Medical Journal because everybody in Singapore wants to publish for the Singaporean audience. They want their research to be adopted in Singaporean hospitals. They want their research to be read by uh, PhD scholars in Singapore. So they don't even care what the impact factor of the journal is. They care who the audience is. So that's why having the right audience for your content is also very, very important. <clears throat> the third qualitative factor is the nature of the journal. Is it predatory or not? I'll cover that in the next slide in more detail. On the quantitative side, we have to look at journal metrics. It's very, very important to understand journal metrics to be able to read and make an analysis out of journal metrics, author metrics, because this directly links to your career. It's not just one article that gets published in a high impact journal. Your career depends on your entire publication history. Your age index depends on the entire body of work that you've published. So it's useful to understand how journal metrics and author metrics work so that you can achieve your career goals. So this is also covered in the journal workshop. Timelines, like I said, it's important to plan your timelines ahead. Uh, it, it's important to understand not just when the journal will publish, but also how much time they will take. You want to work with a journal that has a turnaround time which aligns with you. Generally, journal turnaround time is about three months. But we've seen some high impact journals can take up to six months. And we need to be prepared for that time gap. Otherwise, what if you're working on a research which is, there's a lot of people working on the same topic, there is a fear that you will get beaten to it, right? So you need to look at timelines as well. And you need to choose your publishing model. Uh, a lot of times, everybody thinks we want to publish open access, we want to publish open access, we're okay with APC. 
but that's not the only option there's also hybrid which can allow you some flexibility or you might even consider subscription uh, models because your topic aligns better with a subscription journal so it's important for authors to understand the difference between all these publishing options and we cover all this in the journal workshop very quick information on predatory journal the reason why i'm sharing this here is because predatory journals are a big menace to the industry and they are a menace because they target inexperienced young researchers and they take advantage of the young researchers so the challenge with predatory journals is that most of them predatory publishing itself is not illegal predatory journals are not illegal it is not wrong uh, from a legal standpoint to publish in a predatory journal the challenge with predatory journals is that they are taking advantage of the open access model where the author has to pay to get published now what these journals do is they publish manuscripts in a hurry without doing sufficient peer review without doing sufficient quality checks so what happens is your manuscript will get published if your if the goal of your university is to show a publication at the end of the year your manuscript will get published but it has been published in a journal which doesn't do the right quality checks it doesn't do peer reviews so it is not indexed it doesn't have the audience that you want it to reach it doesn't have the visibility it doesn't have any impact factor so as a result you did get published but you did not get the impact your research didn't get the impact that it should have achieved it should have reached a very large community of very highly renowned scientific readers it did not reach that because the journal that you chose was a public predatory journal and some ways to identify the predatory journals is by looking at their business model so in very much like uh, open access in a predatory journal it's like open access so the author bears the cost you submit a manuscript you will get an intimation of how much you have to pay and then the author has to pay and readers can access the content for free the difference is that on average a good quality index journal average apc is around 3000 to 3 and 1/2000 very rare like lancet lancet nature they have apcs of around 5000 us dollars average apc is around 3000 or 3 and 1/2000 us dollars predatory journals will charge either much more or much less and most importantly they will tell you to pay up front good quality index journals will only tell you the price they will not ask you to pay up front you only have to pay to a journal after you have been accepted do not pay unless your manuscript has been accepted and ready for publication whereas predatory journals will tell you okay you submitted first pay then we will go to peer review definitely do not do that make sure that your manuscript is accepted before you make any payments that's one second is the turnaround time because predatory journals don't do a thorough peer review they will tell you that we will publish your manuscript in a week or we will publish your manuscript by next month if a journal is telling you that they will publish your manuscript next month definitely question on the quality of the journal and the best way to question the quality is go to the journal website scan through the website in detail and scan through the journals also in detail we've seen many predatory journals where the information on the website is inconsistent so even with scopus a lot of journals apply for scopus indexing right the first thing that the scopus team does is go check the website there will we've seen websites where on the home page they've given a different impact factor and then on one of the other pages they have a different impact factor so if the uh, if there is inconsistency in data you can get that from the website a lot of times the predatory journals they will have very nice names of editors but when you try to contact the editors nobody responds or the person doesn't even exist so as an author you have the right to contact any journal editor and ask them what is the nature of your journal and people will surely reply because people are so worried about predatory publishing in our industry you can always write to an editor or an editor in chief and validate whether the journal is a high quality journal or not is it a predatory journal or not we've seen situations where you're trying to reach to the editor and the editor doesn't respond so that's another red flag that you need to look out for so go through this checklist uh, again in that workshop on identifying the right journal we actually share many checklists and online tools 
free tools that you can use before you submit your manuscript to make sure that your journal is a valid journal. So, but be aware of this. And then finally, uh, besides publishing, there is also another aspect of promoting your research. Why am I bringing this up? We know that scientists are shy. Traditionally, we are all, we think of ourselves as academics. We are not social media friendly people. We don't take pictures of everything that we eat. We don't show off. We are, we tend to be more quiet and reserved, but the world is changing. The world is changing in two ways. Number one, the scientific community around the world is becoming very open and vocal. And the second big change is open access publishing itself. Because of open access publishing, scientific information is now not limited to only the scientific community. Scientific information now reaches the common man as well. People are worried. People are worried about their health. People are worried about their diet. People are worried about how to take care of elderly patients. People are worried about dementia. So for those people who are not scientists, but they're worried about health, it is very important that you look at them also as an audience. And to target that audience, you have to start promoting your research. It also helps your career. By promoting your research, you are inviting more citations either directly or indirectly to your article and that helps your career goals as well. So it's very important to promote your research. Uh, of course, you can do everything you can through conference presentations, through graphical abstracts, through videos, through direct scientific promotions, but also bear in mind that there's a lot going on in the parallel promotion industry as well. So nowadays when, uh, I don't know if it's happening at uh, KGMU or so much in India, but in many international universities, when a researcher applies for a job or when a researcher is due for a promotion, we don't look at only the H index or the citation impact of that author anymore. We also look at alt metrics. So we have something like alt metrics or plum analytics where the institution is looking at how many social media mentions do you have? How many tweets and retweets do you have? How many times have you been on the news? How many times have you featured in a newspaper or a magazine? These are all factors that universities are now looking at when a researcher applies for a particular role. So it's important for you to promote your work, not just in the scientific community, but also on social media. I've seen a lot of World Economic Forum, for example, every day on Instagram, World Economic Pro uh, Forum promotes a new piece of research. That's happening. I've also seen researchers using Instagram to recruit candidates for certain studies. So even open internet is becoming a very important forum, be it LinkedIn, be it Mendeley, be it Instagram, be it Facebook, to some extent, people are using these places to directly or indirectly promote their research. Elsevier does it as well. Uh, in certain situations, uh, we do identify authors or outputs which align very well with our institutional strategy and we promote that to our other academic institutions as well. So for example, very recently, uh, there was a manuscript which was written by somebody, uh, an Indian author, very, very powerful manuscript and it got, uh, we worked with that author directly to tweak that manuscript a little bit, improve the quality of writing and it got published in a very, very high impact journal. So now we're working with that author to promote that research to our other customers uh, who are relevant for that topic. So some of you may receive an email from me promoting that research. So even we support authors to get more views, more citations. Uh, we promote it on social media so that your research reads more people. And again, this is something which we can cover in more detail on how you can write an interesting graphical abstract, how you can use search engine optimization, how you can use social media to promote your research, how can you have an impact at a conference paper. All those things are covered in future workshops. So this was a quick summary of my presentation today. As I said, this is all a part of the Health Research Development Program. If you think this is useful, uh, here's the QR code. So if you can just scan this QR code, or as I said, you'll have access to the slides. You can click on the link and give us feedback on which topics are relevant, not relevant. If this is not useful, please let us know. We will not bother you again. So give us feedback and we'll customize future sessions accordingly. With that, I'll pause and I'll check if the audience has any questions.
They said that the uh, research is very good and we are unable to publish it. But we are redirecting the research for the research. All had some sort of an APC model. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me give you my opinion, nothing to do with Elsevier, but my personal opinion, I do agree with you that the predatory model and the open access publishing are very similar. So as I said, the predatory journal is nothing but taking advantage of open access publishing. Now, open access publishing average cost is 3,000 to 3,500, but that number can be different for different people, you know. I'll, I, I respect the fact that you have said that I will not do anything which is paid by the author. And that's a personal decision that you have taken and we respect that. I pers this is my personal opinion. To me, based on my salary and my current commitments, I will not be able to afford an APC more than $1,500. So that's where I draw the line. So everybody has their own definition of what is too much. But in principle, I do agree. Predatory publishing is very similar to open access publishing. It's up to you as an author to decide whether you want to spend that money or not. And if you say that I don't want to spend that money, that's a personal call and that that's everybody has their limits, right? When it comes to being redirected, so a couple of things on that point. Uh, the, the suggestion to redirect doesn't actually come from Elsevier. So you may have submitted the journal to, uh, the, submitted the manuscript to an Elsevier journal we are the Elsevier platform, so the technology is coming from Elsevier. But the recommendation to submit in some other journals actually comes from the peer reviewers. It's the peer reviewers who give the feedback that this manuscript may be better suited in some other journal. It does, that, that decision doesn't come from Elsevier. The Elsevier team, at best, can support with the editor screening stage. And that editor screening stage, we can just give you a pass or fail remark. We can just say, move this manuscript forward or don't move it forward. The, the recommendation to support other, uh, to publish in a different journal comes from the peer reviewers. So that's up to them. Uh, I have seen situations where, uh, like very recently in fact, we're working on a case by one of the major scientists that we work with over here. They were asked to submit to another journal which was offering 100% waiver on their APC. So the author went ahead and did that. There was some tech, the reason why I know about this is that when this resubmitted to that other journal, there were some technical glitches. Initially, they were told that they'll have to pay and the author said, but you said it's 100% waiver. So they came to us, we made sure that they get the 100% waiver. So when it comes to that technical standpoint, we step in and we intervene. Uh, if you have that situation where somebody's asked you to be redirected to another journal, but those other journals all have APCs, check in with us. We might be able to redirect your paper back or we might be able to try to get you an APC waiver or identify another journal which doesn't have APCs or has a lesser APC. So if you get that kind of feedback, you can reach out to us and we'll see what we can do from a technical standpoint. But that recommendation on whether to publish, not publish, whether to publish in journal A or journal B, that comes from the peer reviewers. So we don't have influence on that. But we can at least help you to redirect your manuscript in a, in a manner that it will support your research goals. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Uh. Thank you. 
So that's a very rare situation. I've actually not that that's very unrealistic feedback. I agree. Normally, the feedback that I've seen from peer reviewers is it can be unrealistic in other things. They'll tell you to expand the scope of your study, but that's not possible for everybody. Or they'll tell you to make certain changes to your protocol, or that may not. Like for example, most recently, I saw a manuscript that got a feedback that they need to recollect all of that data. But that wouldn't have been possible because they initially collected the data three years ago, and now it's too late to recollect. That's the kind of peer review feedback I've normally seen. If you do get feedback that you don't agree with, you have a few options. You can actually try to get in touch with the peer reviewer, so the journal can support you. You can try to get in touch with the peer reviewer and negotiate on that feedback. Your second option is to incorporate the feedback. If you're incorporating the feedback. So, letter to the editor generally doesn't have a word limit. So, I'm not surprised that very long letters to the editor get published, especially if somebody is telling you they're almost inviting you to publish as a letter to the editor. They will not look at things like word limit and all that. So, if they're inviting you to do that, there's nothing wrong in it. But it's up to you. The real question is that can you do justice to a systematic review by publishing it as a letter to the editor? So, if I were in your shoes, I would actually. Try to get in touch with the editor or the peer reviewer and negotiate on that point. That if I publish this as a letter to the editor, I'm not doing justice to my research. So I would have negotiated on that. Or else, your third option is to retract your study and target a different journal, which obviously is not the best option. We don't want to do. We also don't want you to do that. So if we discuss this, my recommendation would be that let's try to get in touch with the peer reviewer. Let's try to get in touch with the journal to the the journal editor. And then try to negotiate that. How do we do justice to the study by publishing it as a letter to the editor? I I agree with you. It's hard. Yes, sir. Your article, and it has already been rejected by so many journals. It is better to. Better to confirm the uh, this change to the letter editor and get it published and get away with that article, rather than retracting it and sending it again and getting rejected. It is better to get it published then and there. And I have done it several times. Then to feel relaxed that at least it has got. It's very surprising for me too. I've also never heard. I've heard, like you said, many times that somebody submitted a case report and they got the feedback that it needs to be converted into an original article. That I've heard many times. I've seen it also. But this is a very unique situation. Uh, but it's interesting. Thank you for sharing. I see that people are leaving, so I guess we'll close the session for now. I truly hope this was useful.
They never forced you, force you or compare you, you say they were article. No. Because by transcripts they are article. Just like you have to do little piece of work. The article we have made is clear, all the files are there. It's all there. No, absolutely. All these recommendations are recommendations. The third point is, sometimes these uh, journals, editors are very, uh, I will use it, sympathetic for authors. The research is not available. I sent a case report to General of Neurological Sciences, oh. rejected. And then a society general of this board for neurology in neurological sciences. I transferred that article to that general. The paper uh, was 